Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is the final webinar in a short burst we've done over the last couple of weeks as we've been trying to help you get abreast of some of the issues that church and ministry leaders need to be aware of during this crazy period we're all going through. My name's Gary Williams. I'm the National Director of CMA, and it's my privilege to be your host for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Today's session is titled COVID-19 Impacts and Implications for Commercial Tenants. The presenters today come from a national firm, LPC Cressa, a firm which is headquartered in Sydney with offices around the country and in New Zealand, and a firm who exclusively represent occupiers and tenants. The session will be facilitated by long-term CMA friend, John Reed, who is a non-executive director of the company. John will get us started in just a minute. He'll introduce his team as we go, and then we'll have some time for the end, at the end for your questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, email them to webinars at cma.net.au. I'll collate those questions and pose them to John uh, and the speakers after the main presentation. And we remind you the webinar is being recorded and in the next day or so, we'll send you a link to the recording and a PDF of the slides. So that's it from me. John, I'm gonna hand over to you now. So take us away. Thank you, Gary. And thank you everybody who's on this uh, video conference. And uh, we've been looking forward to presenting to you. Now, I should say at the outset that we had a, uh, the presenters that we had listed, we'd made some, refinements and modifications having regard to the audience and having regard to the time constraints we would have gone too long and so we've adapted the uh, presenters accordingly now the question we're responding to the core question if you can keep it in mind it will uh, give you a, a theme to follow as the different presenters present the question is this the question was a very simple one what can a commercial tenant do to contain occupancy costs during COVID-19? And so, in fact, there are two questions. There's a sub-question or a secondary question to that. I'll repeat that question. What can a commercial tenant do to contain occupancy costs during? The imperative word is during COVID-19. And then secondly, what can a commercial tenant do to get ready for post-COVID-19? the emphasis understandably to date has been the during, the immediate, what about now in relation to the commercial terms and, and agreement. Our aims to uh, support that question are three aims that we have, uh, which we'll do our best to achieve. And the first one is to uh, provide a broadened understanding of the COVID-19 context the economic context, the um, commercial context relating to the leasing arrangements between commercial tenants and landlords. The second one is to understand and to communicate our view, but uh, it's, it's, it's um, substantiated by evidence really, is to understand the fundamental changes to the rules of the game. What game am I referring to? I'm referring to commercial leasing and what rules, I'm referring to the rules around commercial leasing, and we'll speak to that. And the third one is to help you as, as uh, audience members to be better placed to act on behalf of your organization in relation to lease arrangements and to make some, uh, some uh, good judgments as to how you go about the process and uh, achieving the results. Now, my role is to uh, introduce the presentation, which I effectively have done, and the, give some background to the general impacts of COVID-19 on, on uh, commercial tenants. And then uh, very briefly to say a couple of words about Julian and Rebecca. Julian will speak to getting uh, lease arrangements, both interim and into the future, that fit the circumstances. So Julian will be speaking to the fit of the leasing arrangements to the COVID-19 predicament. Rebecca will follow a similar theme and a related theme, but she'll be speaking about the premises because what you lease is physical premises. And she'll be talking about uh, the premises readiness once one's starting to look ahead to a post-COVID-19 situation. Well, you have a slide in front of you, which is a beach scene. And so one might ask the question, well, why on earth do we have that slide? I do think it's implicitly obvious, is that it represents the two core impacts of COVID-19, 
upon the leasing a question, and that has been limited utilization. Julian will speak to that in more detail later. Limited utilization of premises that have one has leased to have utilization of those premises, and then linked to that, but not entirely linked to it, sometimes it's not linked, is the um, impact on most in relation to economic hardship or financial hardship being experienced by the organization, even though it's a not-for-profit organization, that still applies in most instances. So what we will do is to ensure we've got involvement, is we'll start with a quick poll, and uh, Gary will display that poll, and um, uh, we'll get a couple of answers, it's very quick, and see how we go. So there's the poll. How has COVID-19 affected the utilization of your leased premises? Multiple choice, no impact, marginal drop, significant drop, premises not being utilized. How is COVID-19 affecting your financial income? So the first is utilization, the second is the financial income. And the poll is anonymous, so feel free to uh, respond. Once Gary's got sufficient returns, he'll just give us a, a view of the um, results. Okay, I'm just giving people a bit of time to do some mental calculations and to run and consult with the CFO or whatever it is they need to do. We're about a quarter of the people have responded so far. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll give it a little bit longer. Okay, we're up towards 50%. Okay, we'll just give it another 10 seconds or so. Maybe um, not everyone is in a position to respond or is able to respond. Oh no, we're still getting some more responses. Okay, five more seconds and then we'll end it just so that we can keep going with the presentation, but we've got two thirds of the responses in. Thank you, Gary. Okay. And here are the results. Are you seeing that, John? I am. Thank you very much. And so we can see that by far, in a way, the the way the the, the stronger weighting is is of course uh, premises not being utilised, significant drop in utilisation. Uh, we tend to think no impact on utilisation. It could be, for example, an aged care operator um, operating from a fixed facility, um, uh, retirement living. You know that 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 sort of uh, uh, Christian not-for-profit type uh, operation, potentially. Um, and then when we look at the revenues, clearly we can see um, uh, we can see that it's weighted towards marginally reduced and dramatically reduced. So we can close that. Thanks, Gary. And uh, move on to the next slide. So that gives us a sense then of the context that we're dealing with. Impact on utilization, impact on the uh, financial position of the organization, both for profit and not for profit. So, key question what is it that commercial tenants need during this period? I answered that in the first slide, I'm repeating it interim occupancy cost release and leases and premises that are fit for post COVID. Two different time frames we're dealing with here. Now, LPC as tenant, LPC press as tenant advisors. Our focus is on gaining, we, we, are, we, we have a bias towards the tenant and you always need this when there's a conflict of interest. And so we seek to ensure that the share of pain and the fair proportion uh, borne uh, by the landlord it matches the, the facts as one would perceive them from the tenant uh, perspective. A, a, a final prefacing comment is that We've got this remarkable situation currently where tenants are not getting what they signed up for and landlords, it's the same in fact for the landlords, is the parties have entered into an agreement and uh, what, where they've ended up now through COVID, unanticipated and the impacts of COVID is that neither party is in the situation that was intended. I'll give, the, I'll give a very simple example uh, of this before I move off the point. If you take, in a, you take a mall situation, and I do see, for example, not-for-profits in some malls like Mission Australia and, 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 and sort of a second-hand retail or a pseudo-retail or, 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 or a proper retail type uh, organization, is that the tenants would have signed up based on statistics, statistics of foot traffic and so on. And clearly, 
those statistics are not the case uh, currently. And this is what I mean by people having signed into lease agreement where the uh, stats uh, originally contemplated are not the reality now. And so the next slide, please. So what the next slide is dealing with is the next slide is dealing with the context in which tenants and landlords are working out this shared pain, this interim occupancy cost relief, and the context in which the longer term arrangements will be modified and worked out. And so I've used this slide to, uh, which just depicts a very, you know, news release from April 3, which is already old hat, uh, from Prime Minister Morrison. And, and speaking to the framework which was to come, which has now come as of yesterday, in relation to guidelines and a mandatory code for firms with revenues from 50 million down. Now, why have I used this? I've used this because it's April 3, the announcement, and we've already moved to, uh, to uh, April 7 with a further announcement. I've used it because the little picture there is straight from our website. And notice it says, receive our weekly COVID-19 updates for tenants. The imperative word being weekly. <laughs> so the context in which this negotiation between landlords and tenants is taking place is evolving very quickly. And the impacts are evolving very quickly. Take a very simple example, take a restaurant where the initial impact was a drop in attendance. Next impact was, close the restaurant and just have a takeaway. Next impact, in many instances, close the operation. So it's an evolving context, it's evolving impact. So the next slide, please. And this really um, cements or echoes the point that I've just made. If you look at the dates there, you see April 3, and if you look at the, at the, at the uh, next slide, April 7, and, uh, and our little, weekly updates, you can see how quickly this is moving. And so we, for our clients and tenants via our website and other means, are this morning have already released our commentary on the code and the implications therefore. And I mentioned that so that you can uh, take that and have a good look because we're time constrained in this forum. Next slide, please. So in the pursuit of interim relief, and the pursuit of having lease arrangements that fit a post-COVID situation, it's the word which I hardly ever use this word, the word that I've used on this slide is unprecedented solutions. This is unprecedented, the context is unprecedented. Uh, it's a word that gets used too loosely, but it's precisely and accurately and appropriately used here. So it's unprecedented solutions are required for interim relief, an unprecedented representation is required to make premises and leases, both of those things, a fit for post-COVID. There's nothing straightforward. The rules of the game have not been defined in a way that suits what we're dealing with here. So three principal points that even though the context has been changing, even though the government continues to um, it's not revised, it's to clarify the uh, position and to make it more mandatory. Is there three things that are certain uh, about what we're dealing with? And those are the points that are uh, uh, given on this slide. Pre-COVID-19, as far as commercial leasing is concerned, the ink is dry. You know, we've done, <laughs> you've signed, it's done, you live with it, the tenant must live with it. The second point is it was always lessee beware. Is uh, let's see, think through the issues, think through the facts, and take appropriate uh, judgments and decisions. And the third one was that if there was a dispute, is that generally it would be resolved by some sort of mediation or um, a forum, yeah, mediation or, or some sort of legal resolution. And in general terms, now the situation we've entered into is the concept of the ink of dry is gone. The uh, lessee beware is replaced by less or to share, share what share pain, and the legal resolution is replaced by negotiated re resolution is the is the default and even mandated position in the current circumstances. So with that, I'll uh, go to the next slide, please, and introduce um, 
um, uh, with a few words, just say what Julian and then Rebecca following will speak to. Julian's focus will be on the principles that I've uh, spoken to and, and, and building on those, elaborating on those, and focusing on, on the leasing question, getting leases right for the interim during the COVID episode and then for post. Rebecca will change that and she'll focus on getting premises right for post COVID. And we'll draw on some of our experiences of our own uh, not for profit clients and many of them, uh, Christian not for profit clients, to try and make it as real as possible. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, John. So, as as John mentioned, I'll be focusing on the impacts and solutions for commercial tenants. What we've done is we've divided it into two. One is the immediate impact and the long-term impact. And they're both very relevant um, individually. So if we look at the interim uh, solution or, or, the, or the impact, it's limited utilization. Um, so not being able to occupy the space uh, the way that we had intended to. In, in addition to or combined with financial hardship. Um, and I'll talk to this a little bit more in later slides. The long-term solution um, is around what, what, what will we learn out of this process and how will it change the way that we work? And, and obviously the key point here is the mobile working, everyone having to work from home. Uh, how will that feed into the business requirements going forward and what changes will there be? Um, and then ultimately, what do we need to do in relation to our leases and how can we adapt them for the future? Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is what do commercial tenants need? Um, and again, we've divided it into three or this time into three slides which is the interim um, agreement that we need to look at, the post or planning for po what post COVID will look like, and then implementing the strategy from the plan, the post COVID plan. So uh, if we go back to the number one, which is the interim um, requirement is any claim that we make with a landlord, um, needs to be substantiated. So we need to be clear that we can't utilize the premises in the same way. Um, we've got clients, not-for-profit clients, that are currently occupying their space, office space at around five to 10%, um, which is effectively not using it. Um, we've also had a client this week uh, effectively close down a large office um, and, and canceled all the access cards for all the employees. So. Um, interesting times. Um, that combined with a financial impact, which is a reduction in the revenue, um, and also increases in costs. Um, again, I got off the phone yesterday to a client, a not-for-profit, and the costs for them have increased. And as an example, uh, they made a comment about uh, the personal protective equipment that they need to supply their staff has gone up 600% during this time, which is a huge increase. So we need to be very mindful of um, the impacts. Um, those two items combined um, give rise to the requirement for a reduction in rental um, or rental relief. And um, many of you may fall into the category of the JobKeeper program, which provides us, uh, as of yesterday, uh, a mandatory uh, obligation on the landlord and the tenant to sit down and talk through what that relief will look like. And that relief looks like, uh, or will be a minimum of 50% um, waiver of the rent and, and the and, and, and potentially the balance repaid over a, a period of time, uh, the balance of the lease term. Obviously that, that reduction in rent will have to have um, a correlate, a cor it need to be correlated with the reduction in revenue. But what's important here is that it's still subject to a negotiation. So um, skilled negotiation is very important uh, when talking to the landlord and very much evidence-based. So we need to demonstrate the, um, the impacts and uh, in order to get to the outcome. So we're, 
we're very much on top of this now with our clients and something that uh, we've been talking to landlords about since March and will continue to do so in April and something that um, uh, we need to be doing uh, now whilst, whilst the need is, is there. In terms of the post-COVID plan is, um, is looking around what the business needs are. So what, um, we need to understand what changes there will be to the business and what changes will be needed. Um, so will the space change? Um, will we look at different locations? Flexibility um, is an important piece. Obviously, um, one of the things that is likely to change in this climate is um, the funding, whilst the funding arrangements, the government funding arrangements will probably stay the same for the immediate future. They may change in the longer term, given the amount of stimulus that has been put out um, into the economy. Uh, also, we know that during a financial downturn, typically donations reduce as well. So that's something that we need to consider. Um, and so uh, we need to look at what flexibility do we need going forward. And also implementing some of the changes that were implemented during the interim solution, um, which is a, a principally based uh, outcome during a crisis like this. Uh, and, and the premises needs, which Rebecca will talk to more, um, is equally as important. So what does a workplace look like? What changes do we need to make? Um, and again, that has to be happening now. Um, we want to ensure that we're ready when COVID-19 passes so that we can hit the ground running and, 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 um, and move forward. Number three is the post, sorry, if we just go back quickly. So post COVID, uh, getting the lease ready um, is, is negotiating those leases now, um, making sure that we implement the plan that we've set out and, um, and, and we make those things happen. And again, in relation to the premises works that would be required, um, it's uh, something that I'll let Rebecca talk to in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So what does a fair proportion in rent look like? Um, and I think what's important here is that we start with the end in mind. So uh, Stephen Covey said, to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so, you, so, that, you are better, so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. Um, and the Prime Minister said something along the lines of what is important as part of this code is that both parties negotiate in good faith. The turnover, rent, the turnover reduction of the tenant needs to be reflected in the rental waiver of the landlord. So we're not looking to profit out of this situation. Um, it needs to be evidence-based. And what we may do now is just do a quick poll to get a sense of where you are all up to in relation to achieving relief. Um, so Gary, if you wouldn't mind putting that poll up. So it'll be interesting to see where everyone is up to in relation to seeking relief. How are we going there, Gary? How are people responding? Yeah, uh, we've only had about half the people respond from last time. We'll give them another 10 or 15 seconds. Sure. I think they're still sort of making their way through there. Okay, just another few seconds and we'll see what people have had to say. Okay, we'll close it off and uh, you should be able to see that, Julian. Are you seeing that now? Uh, not yet, no. What about now? Uh, no. Can you maybe, do you want to just read out the results quickly? If you've, uh, you've got visibility? 
Yeah, okay. My screen is saying that attendees are now viewing the poll results. Faith, could you just use a little raise your hand thing to tell me if you can see those poll results? Okay, we might not. My screen says that the attendees are now viewing the results, but here's Here's what the answers are saying. So the first question, has your organization achieved interim rent relief since the start of one said yes, 12 said no. So the vast majority are no. Question two, has your organization made approaches to your landlord in relation to rent relief? 10 have said yes, three have said no. So a significant majority have made, represent, made approaches. And then has your organization made approaches to landlords for, for rent relief that have been rejected? Um, nobody, okay. nobody has had um, approaches that have been rejected. Thank you. So what we've done, I mean, that's interesting. Um, it's obviously, uh, it's, we're all talking about it, but we obviously haven't landed on a solution. So what we've put together here, and apologies for the slide, it's, uh, the, the formings come out a little bit um, different to what we had intended. The, um, the rating tool, is dividing what we consider to be a favourable outcome versus a not favourable outcome. And the reason we've put this together is to demonstrate what is shared pain with the landlord, the principle of saying we can't occupy those premises, which is not our fault and it's not the landlord's fault, but it has to be a shared problem. So a favourable outcome is where the rental is waived um, or a proportion of the rental is waived without the need to repay um, a proportion or all of that, um, all of that waived rent. So um, that versus a not favorable outcome, which is a requirement to, I guess, defer the payment um, or defer rental with the requirement to repay. Um, and again, the, the, the issue with not favorable is that the landlord isn't taking any pain here. Um, we're effectively de delaying what our obligations were anyway. So um, very, um, these are very valid in relation to our discussions with landlords. And I'll just make a point here that the mandated um, government announcement refers to a minimum of 50% of the rental being waived having regard to the reduction in the turnover. So even the government is, is clear on the fact that it's a minimum of 50%. Not, um, it's not to be necessarily deferred and repaid um, at a later stage, but only a portion of that. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So here I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what, what, what do we need to do to implement the interim solution? And um, we've just got a couple of dot points there, but the key is again, to keep the end in mind is, is, is to be structured um, in your discussions. We wanna know the basis of re requesting relief or requiring relief, I should say, um, and we need to set it out clearly. Uh, we wanna to get to a, we wanna get a quick response. And, and so we need to implement a phased approach. The, the we will need to substantiate what the reduction in utilisation has been. And um, I think that's quite easy to do in this climate, as well as what the impacts have been on a financial basis. And here, uh, the principle around that is very, is very valid um, with the landlord. So we wanna make sure that the landlord is on board with that. Uh, we wanna be aware and expect that the landlord's going to delay any request or, or, or requ you know, our re the relief. Um, and they'll be asking for things like, give us your past financials, which are irrelevant um, and also potentially pleading poverty. So we need to be aware of that. Um, we need to be aware and expect that they're going to ask for trade-offs. Um, and an example of a trade-off that wouldn't be acceptable is, is, the, um, uh, is an extension of term, which doesn't have any relevance to the relief being provided. So a three month relief with a three month, a three year extension to the term just wouldn't be appropriate. Um, we want to always refer to the government direction and, or not always, but we want to make sure that if there's negative pushback that we refer to the government direction, um, which is great evidence um, to use. 
We want to f formalize the agreements um, quickly because the need is now. Um, and again, just make one in terms of the principle, obviously the principle with the landlord, establishing that with the landlord will make implementing it and getting to a solution far easier. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the post COVID-19 plan is, again, it's doing this now so that we're ready come post uh, COVID. We want to make sure we're considering what the business uh, impact will be um, on the lease and the premises. What, um, what, will, yeah, what will the changes need to look like? Um, we, and, and the key, key change we expect will be flexible lease terms going forward. Um, you know, having regard to government funding that may end at some point in time, um, making sure that we can contract or terminate the leases um, going forward. Um, so there's a number of things to consider in the, the post COVID-19 plan, but the key is also to have those discussions now and finalize them quickly. Um, uh, we always talk about leverage and, and time is leverage. So we, um, we suggest doing that as soon as possible. I'll now hand over to Rebecca to talk a little bit about the, um, the premises. Thank you, Julian. Hi, everyone. So um, I thought I'd start out by just talking about what the old norm was um, with respect to premises, and it was very focused on being present. Uh, space was designed to support bumping into your colleagues, um, to promote collaboration, and a variety of spaces and settings would be uh, designed to enable that face-to-face -face working. There were and um, a lot of tools that had been um, rolled out to allow remote working, but very few of the workforce had actually adopted those tools um, as part of their, their work life. And a lot of it was driven by um, individuals, uh, personal commitments to family and the stage of life they're in. So um, the current norm, where forced isolation has shown that a remote and distributed workforce can, and in many industries, be as, as productive as a, a present workforce has been the new norm for most industries. And it has accelerated the adoption of mobile working and technology. So what we are anticipating will happen is that the new norm post COVID, the pendulum will swing back slightly, but not all the way to pre-COVID. So the, um, the shift has been significant. One of the predictable impacts or some of the predictable impacts of COVID-19 um, will be the sustained um, increased unemployment levels, and it will take some time before that is corrected. There will be continuing financial hardship both personally and for organisations, and um, likely a reduction in the donations to charities um, as a result. So what does that pose as far as problems and outcomes in respect of premises? Well, we believe that everything will change. Every organisation will need smart strategies and solutions to rebuild their organisations and um, provide the services that they um, do to the community. So management teams will be asking questions about um, why do we have all of this real estate? We aren't utilising it. And now in the new norm, how can we make our premises fit for purpose? So what we see happening will be that there will be a lot of consolidation of premises into um, smaller footprints um, and with increased utilisation and densities. And the challenge is how to make those spaces work uh, and be fit for purpose. We also see that as a result of that, there will be closures of offices and premises and having to make good and um, negotiating that with landlords or, and or physically returning the premises to their prior tenant um, condition. Also as part of that, there's handing back space and, and Julian's mentioned, but there are a number of ways to do that, including surrendering premises, 
subleasing, uh, petitioning floors, um, and only occupying smaller footprints. Um, as part of that, uh, and making the the premises that are utilised fit for purpose, one of the key questions is how can we make our people and visitors to premises safe? Um, and so there will be a lot of a discussion around those protocols and how the workplace um, can provide that protection. And also because of the, um, the stress um, on organisations and individuals and clients, you know, how can we refresh or, or make our premises, um, refocus our group and um, allow us to move forward in a positive um, manner. So we see a lot of uh, representing workspaces um, in a way that will um, promote collegiate um, and a, a positive attitude to the future. We also see that um, a lot of the items that I've just discussed will also be uh, facilitated probably um, or initiated by mergers and uh, consolidations. Um, so organisations as they uh, strive to maintain relevant and financial in the future will merge and consolidate um, and be looking to minimise their real estate costs and maximise the outcomes. So exiting leases, making good, refurbishing their premises. And these are all things that we're currently working with clients um, now about analysing, you know, how can we move them from their pre-COVID-19 to their, their future way of working and what are the costs and the time and the, um, the risks associated with doing that. So um, we see that there will be um, a injection of activity um, in representing and repositioning assets um, after COVID-19. Maybe I could hand over to John. Did you want to continue, John? Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks very much. So our next slide, please, which is our last slide, and then we've got time for Q&A. Um, so to summarise, this, this, this slide um, puts together what Rebecca and Julian have spoken to and what I spoke about, and, um, and really summarising is, is in relation to interim occupancy cost relief principles, restating them, shared pain principle, substantiate the position and ensure that the representation or the position of the landlord is skilled. And then looking ahead to post COVID, get there early, uh, look to ensure that the leases in the long term are renegotiated, restructured. There's the opportunity to do that now during COVID to fit for purpose with the future business requirements, having regard to the future business requirements. And with the premises, if I summarize what Rebecca was saying, it's rethink, reshape, and refresh to fit the future business requirements. Thank you very much. And Gary, I hand to you for the questions. Okay, well, we have just a couple of questions and I'll just direct them to you, John, and you can field them how you will. Um, the first one, I think we've sort of covered, but if you could just, you know, summarize the answer to this, if rental reduction is to be in proportion to the reduction in income, how do we verify that? Is it just a conversation in good faith or can we request for something? If so, what information? So how do you answer that, you know, succinctly? Yes, and if I could ask my fellow uh, panellists, Julian and Rebecca, if you could just unmute and, be, uh, and, and put video on as well. Um, so uh, in principle, if, if this is, the question is asked in, as I made the point earlier on, in an evolving context. And so we apply judgment and, and good decision making. So our logical answer to that is that you uh, you get to the principle of the matter. The principle of the matter is landlord to share in the pain, and and then you substantiate the reality. Um, you 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 think about utilization. Julian, for example, quoted some statistics, and you write that stuff down. You capture it in relation to financial hardship. Is, is we've had some responses for landlords where they've asked for historic uh, financials and so on, which Julia, Julian has indicated. Really speaking, is the financials now and into the future. It's the impact that it will have. So one has to apply one's mind to the forecasting. That's the principle of the matter. 
Now, the government's created a few easy defaults to substantiate the fact there's been hardship. But there's going to be some organizations who can't uh, communicate the reality of the position by just using those defaults, and they shouldn't disqualify themselves. So our representation always goes to the heart of the principle, and then we build up representation which, which has regard to those principles and seeks a negotiated solution uh, in the principle of shared pain. And look, there's a second part to this question, and it's coming from a landlord's perspective. If tenants are eligible for the JobKeeper payment, that could be used as a grounds for negotiating leases during this time. Do we have to find this out ourselves as landlord? And if so, how do we find out? Or again, is this going on the word of the tenants? Can you just uh, repeat that question, Gary, if you don't mind? If tenants are eligible for the JobKeeper payment, that could be used as grounds for negotiating leases during this time. Do we have to find this out for ourselves as landlord? And if so, how do we find it out? Or again, is it just going on the word of the tenants? Yeah, again, it's new. I was going to hand that to Julian, but I think that's a quick answer, I think. Again, the situation is, is new and the processes are being evolved. I'm talking about the governmental processes and, something, and so on. But I think substantiation and evidence is part of, the, of what's required here. Okay, I've got a question here, someone for Julian, you highlighted that the requirement for landlords to waive a defer rent by 50% was a minimum requirement. Please elaborate on that. So if the mandated um, announcement yesterday was for companies below 50 million in revenue or turnover who are eligible for the JobKeeper program, um, had the right to go to the landlord seeking a proportionate reduction in the rental. So let's just say that the, the, the turnover had reduced by 40% and they were eligible in relation to the 50 million, below 50 million and the JobKeeper program, then the rental would reduce automatically by 40%. Um, the, 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 the statement I made was that that 40% reduction, the government made a comment that at least 50% of that 40% reduction would be rental that would be waived and not having to be re required to be repaid. And that's the negotiation piece with a landlord um, is how much of that should be fully waived um, or is there another, uh, is there a deferred? And our principle is that obviously acting for tenants, we want to make sure that that is waived as much as possible. Can I add, can I add just something to that? Because I think that's a very, very important question, probably one of the most important questions. And Niels, if I can ask you, if you uh, could move the slide back to the slide that Julian used, which had Scott Morrison's uh, quotation. Um, um, so we very strong on getting to the principle, which a point I made just now, and following on from what, from what Julian has said, is the code that has come out specifically states, I think it uses the words, a minimum of 50%. That's in the code. But when you look at Morrison's uh, statements, he's saying what is important part of this code is that both parties negotiate in good faith. The turnover reduction of the tenant needs to be reflected in the rental waiver of the landlord. And so the principle is, 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 is effectively is a waiver aligned to the reduction in the turnover. I think that needs to be understood. What the government has created is a flaw. The government has created and said, um, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not trying, I'm just trying to use, be quick, but the, the government has said that anything outside of uh, uh, less than a 50% direct waiver uh, is just not permissible, not allowable. So they've created a flaw for good faith negotiations getting to this principle. That would be our representation. That's the position that we would come from. Okay, here we have one. If an organization does not qualify for the government's job keeper program, then does that mean they lie outside the code for landlords and tenants and cannot get rental relief? You want to handle that, Julian? Yeah, look, the answer is absolutely um, uh, eligible. I think if we look at the two key principles, which is the space utilisation, as well as a reduction in turnover, 
um, we should we absolutely need to be talking to the landlord. And you know, in many ways, the principles put forward by the government um, are the principles that are, you know that they apply to every single tenant. Um, so the, the simple answer is absolutely we should be, and, and, and we need to be doing that now. So again, to add to what Julian has said, Julian said it very accurately. The only point that I would add is that the mandatory code, mandatory code covers the uh, category that was being referred to. The principles cover everybody. The intention covers everybody. It just means that the representation and the negotiation needs a lot more good faith. Okay. Got a question here, post-COVID, maybe for Rebecca. Funds are likely to be tight post-COVID. Do you have any guidance for low-cost touch-ups to premises that could add to post-COVID productivity? Very good. Very good question. Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose part of the conversation on negotiations with landlords can be um, talking about incentives or, so one thing would be a conversation with the landlord about incentives or opportunities for them to help fund um, any refreshment uh, or refurbishment works required. And there has been, I mean, a lot of our organisations we work with we focus on reuse of um, furniture and equipment. And so by approaching work in a very pragmatic way um, with the mindset of being economical, but also environmentally friendly, um, the approach of reuse is one that we support. So okay. uh, that would be my first two points. Let's talk to the landlord about their contribution and then how can we do it where we repurpose efficiently. Okay. Well, just do one more question. We've just gone past our finish time and sneaking past by a few minutes is no problem. So final question, in talking about a reduction of turnover, do we measure this on a percentage basis or on a monetary amount of the reduction in revenue? Can I answer that? Um, I mean, I would have suggested it be a percentage because the percentage is, is proportionate, is the proportionate reduction to the rental. So if it's a reduction of 25 or sorry, 35%, then the rent should proportionately reduce by 35%. Okay. Well, look, thanks. Uh, we might close it off there. It brings us uh, to an end. Thank you, uh, John and team for being with us and giving us some direction in these matters. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. As I said, we'll be sending you a webinar recording in the PDF notes tomorrow. And then CMA is going to take a short break over Easter. So you won't hear from us for a little while. Uh, so may you and your family and your team have a blessed Easter. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. That's it for me. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.